This is part three of a guest lecture Lily gave recently to undergraduates at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. This part covers about the typical approaches and challenges of deploying AI in the workplace today. Now, this is of course a simplified cartoon scenario of what is happening in the workplace, and every company is different. This just serves to highlight some themes that we see across the board. Here, we have the big boss. With the recent advances in AI, he is realizing that AI is now easier and cheaper to use than ever before because it is more generalizable, often usable without any further training, and it understands natural language. So everyone in the company can use it regardless of whether they know how to code or not. Moreover, AI can do so much more, including generating texts, images, videos, code, and more. It can even call tools, like proprietary APIs, to execute actions like an AI agent. So the boss declares to his team that he wants to transform how the company works using AI. However, many members of the team may be confused on what exactly the boss means by this. Does using AI mean something as simple as using ChatGPT to help out here and there? Or does the boss mean a major new initiative? At this point, the company might bring in a chief digital officer. In different companies, this role might have different titles. The CDO can help to translate the high-level business goals into tangible initiatives too and help the company figure out where are the best and most impactful ways to use AI. He groups them into four buckets. Firstly, is to empower everyone in the company to have access to the right tools and to have the right training to be able to figure out for themselves how to use these tools to improve individual productivity. Secondly, to evaluate critical processes which often span across teams and departments to see where AI can drive greater speed, accuracy, cost-effectiveness, scalability, etc. The answer to this question is going to be different for different industries. Thirdly, Think about how customer offerings and services can be reimagined to drive better products and ultimately top-line growth. The fourth item is more of a long-term, macro consideration. How much AI changed the business model, the value chain, and the whole industry? How might the company disrupt themselves before others do? If we map these buckets to business impact, you will see that the first two are primarily related to improving efficiency and reducing cost. The third bucket is about how to drive new sources of revenue, and the fourth one is more about long-term sustainability and resiliency. All this might sound a bit abstract. Let's take two examples and walk through these four buckets together. Let's start with a law firm. Every individual in a law firm, whether it be partners or entry-level paralegals, have a lot of paperwork. It might be to do with researching past cases, summarizing documents, drafting contracts, and more. The first bucket involves getting the tool into the hands of everyone in the firm sometimes with customized interfaces with pre-populated prompts that are relevant to the legal industry. It also involves providing the training and guide rails to ensure everyone knows the capabilities, but also risks and weaknesses of these new technologies. Moving on to bucket two. One common critical process for a law firm and all professional services companies for that matter is KYC. It stands for Know Your Customer. Before companies take on new clients, they will go through a rigorous process to ensure that there are no conflicts with the work being done by the firm for another client, and also ensure that the business or affiliations of the client is known so that impact of sanctions, anti-money laundering, and other risks are well understood. This process requires drawing information from a lot of different sources, researching the client and bringing it all together for a final decision. AI can help make this more efficient. It is often in bucket two that companies find that the type of AI they need may not be the kind that everyone is talking about. There are many types of AI approaches and it should be selected based on the specific problem that the company is trying to solve weighed up against the cost of training and running such models, risks, desired level of explainability and so on. Moving on to the third bucket. For a law firm that is involved with litigation and dispute resolution, a critical process for the company might be how it uses its expertise to help a client decide when to settle a case before it gets to the trial and how much to settle for. In order to know this, the firm would need to know based all the information it has about the case and precedents. What is the probability of winning and how much can be expected if the case went all the way through to the trial? This is an area where law firms might employ AI to make such predictions. Sorry, the guy in this video looks kind of sketchy, but coming on to the fourth bucket where we contemplate macro risks to the business model. Traditionally, lawyers charge by the hour. So where is the incentive to be more efficient? If you work less hours, do you end up charging the client less and end up making less revenue? This is an example of a disruptive impact that could lead to changes in pricing models. 
It is difficult because there is often a trade-off between short-term needs and long-term considerations. Let's take another example, a hotel booking e-commerce website like Expedia, Hotels.com, or Booking.com. Let's skip on to bucket two. A critical process for these websites is placing millions of bids onto search engines like Google to buy traffic based on keyword combinations at the right price. Billions of dollars are spent in this way, and this type of requires quantitative optimization. You would typically be willing to bid a higher amount per click for someone searching for New York Hotels 4 Star than you might pay for someone just searching for New York Hotels, as more precise searches is correlated with higher purchase intent and ultimately higher conversion. AI can help to optimize bids in processes like this, which can save a lot of inefficient marketing dollars. An example of bucket three for a hotel booking website might be a completely new user interface. Instead of having to come onto a website to search for hotels, perhaps the interface is integrated into mobile messaging and all the user needs to do is to describe what he or she needs in natural language and the AI agent can provide more personalized recommendations. This could drive a new revenue stream for these companies. On to bucket four. If more and more users shifted to using their mobile and asking chatbots to do their travel planning, then could business models that were built off of getting traffic from search engines through paid search marketing or SEO be challenged? Having talked through those two examples, I hope it is clear how this simple framework can help think through the ways AI can help or disrupt companies. The role of a CDO is not straightforward. Not only does he or she need to identify the areas of greatest potential for the company, they are also trying to navigate a minefield of risks at the same time, and the landscape is changing rapidly. Here are some examples. From a product perspective, companies need to think about questions like buy versus build, whether the offerings can support the range of languages that the company operates in at a commensurate level of quality, and also how to manage the issues that probabilistic AI models can present, such as hallucinations. Moreover, there are illegal risks to consider, and new laws are emerging month by month. For example, how to maintain data security and privacy and whether using some of the large foundation models trained on non-transparent corpuses can expose one to liability in copyright infringement. There are financial considerations such as the capital expenditure and the operating costs of these models, how the company might define as being success metrics for AI use, how to calculate the return on investment, and so on. Even more challenging than technical issues are human factors, which are often underestimated by companies. Do employees even want to help the company to become more efficient? Who gets the benefit of those efficiencies? Is it only shareholders? Then that is the benefit to the employees? Could employees perceive AI as a threat to their jobs? Are they operating under any kind of cognitive bias that leads them to prematurely conclude that their jobs are too complex to use AI? The term shadow AI use has been used to describe employees who secretly use AI, but does not share that explicitly for some of the reasons provided above. We will now choose a few to discuss in more detail, but I hope that this gives you a feel for the complex landscape that companies today are facing as they embark on this AI journey. The first one we will deep dive into is the problem of embedded bias. In 2023, Bloomberg ran a study using an image generation tool called Stable Diffusion. In this study, they defined 14 types of jobs, seven high paying and seven low paying. Examples of high-paying jobs include lawyers, CEOs, engineers, and architects. Examples of low-paying jobs include housekeeper, janitor, and fast food worker. For each job, they asked Stable Diffusion to create 300 images of faces. They then categorized each face according to skin color and plotted this chart here. The top row are the high-paying jobs and bottom row are low-paying jobs. What can you see? The high-paying jobs are represented by faces with predominantly light-colored skin tone, and conversely, the low-paying jobs have largely dark color skin tone. Skin tones is not the only problem. What do you see here? The top row are all males, and the bottom row are predominantly females. Statistically, this might be a reflection of the biases in our society today. However, is this how we want our AI models to behave? Well, Google believed no. That is not how we want the models to behave and hence has invested a lot of resources into teams focused on responsible AI practices. In February 2024, Google's Gemini model, which was capable of generating images, had the opposite problem. In an attempt to ensure that images generated represented a quote-unquote fair distribution of skin color and gender, the model ended up refusing to create historically accurate images of white males. You see generated images of the Pope here on the left, and images of medieval knights represented as Asian females on the right. 
senior executives at Google had to issue a public apology. Let's look into another challenge. It is coined the Jagged Frontier by Professor Ethan Mollick. In a study conducted at the Harvard Business School together with the management consulting firm, BCG, they split 760 consultants into two groups, each tasked with a typical consulting task. One task involves creative product innovation and the second one related to business problem solving. Both are representative of work that consultants do day to day. Within each group, some consultants had access to GPT-4, some didn't. Just to give you a sense of what those tasks are, here are the details. Can you guess whether GPT-4 would be helpful to these tasks? Well, surprisingly, the consultants who had access to GPT-4 saw a 40% improvement in performing task A, but saw a decline in task B GPT-4 actually impeded the performance of the consultants when they tried to do task B. The concept of the jagged frontier is that there are tasks that are inside the frontier, such as task A, but there are also tasks which appear to be of a similar level of complexity, but is just outside the frontier. If companies try to employ AI to the wrong type of tasks, they can be eroding value. What makes this more complicated is that the frontier is moving quickly day by day, so companies need to keep testing and make the right decisions on where and when to use AI. Let's talk about environmental considerations. Did you know that these large language models today, like GPT-4, takes US $100 million to train? Much of this is due to the tremendous power consumption needed for these computations. Training GPT-4 is said to use the equivalent of five years of energy use by 1,000 average U.S. households. Not only is the training part energy intensive, the inference part also uses a lot of energy. Every time someone chats to chat GPT, energy is consumed. Two months after launch, inference use on chat GPT in John 2023 used as much electricity per month as did 26,000 U.S. households. Researchers believe that human brains are 1,000 one million times more energy efficient than these state-of-the-art neural networks, and hence much research is going into how to improve the energy efficiency of these digital brains. Finally, the threat to jobs. People often say that the performance of these LLMs are equivalent to employees two, three years out of colleague. So as undergraduate students, what does this mean for you? How can you best position yourself to ride the wave of AI? Back in the old days, we had to work for many years before we were promoted from individual contributors to being team leaders. The good news for you is that straight out of the gate, you will be a team leader. You will be the team leader of some very nascent but capable AIs. How can you best recruit and lead your team to do what fresh grads coming into the workplace has never been able to do before? This is the opportunity for you. If you like this lecture, feel free to follow Lily Cheng on her LinkedIn page.